Hi, I'm Lana Glowshot, and in this video, I'm going to be drawing this pig. Along the way, I'm going to be sharing 10 tips for drawing fur that are applicable for artists of all levels. So you can immediately put these into practice whether you're starting your very first animal drawing or your 50th. And I wanna make sure that you stay all the way to the end because at the end, I have a special bonus for you. I actually made a mistake on this drawing and I'm gonna share with you how I fixed it and how you can finish up your drawings with confidence. Tip number one is to start with a really solid line drawing. When you are drawing animals with fur or hair, it's important to start with this really solid structure before you begin rendering the surface texture. Think about building a house. You wouldn't start decorating the interior until the foundation was poured and the walls were built. And drawing animals is the exact same. To do this, you need to look beyond the surface texture and establish the proportions and the major planes before you ever begin rendering the texture of the fur. I typically like to begin with a line drawing either on a separate sheet of paper or on my final drawing surface. And most of the time I do this by hand, looking at my photo reference, carefully measuring, and then transferring that information onto my paper. If you are not super confident with your drawing skills yet, you can definitely trace your photo reference, but you're never going to get confident with your drawing skills unless you practice. So make sure that you build that in once in a while. If you are interested in learning more about how to measure and how to create a line drawing, I have the whole process that I use in my online course, and there is a link for a free trial down in the notes below. Tip number two is to consider your color composition. Studying the proportions and creating a careful line drawing are part of establishing a pleasing composition, but another part of that is establishing and planning color relationships. This drawing is done on a piece of pastel mat, and one of the awesome things about pastel mat is that it comes in a wide variety of colors. So the very first decision that I make when it comes to color is actually the color of the pastel mat that I will be using. I had one pad of pastel mat available when I started working on this piece, so I got to choose from either these two gray shades or these two yellow shades. And while any of these probably would have worked okay, I leaned towards a yellow because I wanted some of that warmth to come out and I wanted to have some contrast while I was developing the fur. And I felt that I wouldn't have quite enough contrast if I had one of those gray pieces of paper instead. There isn't a perfect choice when it comes to selecting the color that you use for your animal drawing. It could be a very intuitive process for you where you just pick a color that you like, or you can apply some of your pre-existing color theory knowledge to selecting a color that will be harmonious or complementary. Whatever you do, just pick your color thoughtfully and intentionally. And if you would like some more support on selecting the color for your pastel mat or the color of paper that you're going to use, let me know in the notes below and I can include that in an upcoming video. After I pick out my piece of pastel mat, I then transfer my line drawing onto the surface and begin applying a base layer of pan pastels. Now, pan pastels are by no means necessary when it comes to making animal drawings, but I like them for a couple reasons. One reason is that they lay down a base layer really quickly, so I'm able to see how all of the colors work together in a very short amount of time. These pan pastel base layers take me anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, and I can then make sure that the background color is working with the colors in the animal. I can make shifts and changes if I need to, and then I have this really great color plan before I ever begin with the texture or the fine hair details. If you do not use pan pastels, you could maybe make some quick sketches or do some swatching with your colored pencils to see what colors you like together and how you want to work with color throughout your piece. I don't show the pan pastel process in this particular video, but if you do want more information on how to use pan pastels for a base layer, I have a ton of pan pastel resources in the notes below, and I'll also link a video here. Tip number three is to finalize the background before finalizing the foreground. 
when you're working on any drawing, it's a really good idea to kind of bounce around your composition and make sure that you're building the entire drawing up as a whole so that no one piece gets way too ahead of the other pieces. But at a certain point, you need to transition from working on your pieces and developing them to finishing them. And when you are transitioning into that space, I recommend finishing the background before you finish the foreground. On an animal portrait, this is incredibly important because you want those teeny little hairs around the edge of your animal to overlap the background. And if you don't have your background finished, you're going to end up drawing around each of these hairs that you've just drawn. So you don't necessarily have to finish the whole background at once. I typically will work on one area at a time. I'll finish the background and then I'll move on to the hairs in the subject that overlap the background. And then I'll do the same thing and finalize another part of the drawing, moving piece by piece in that process where I'm finalizing everything. Tip number four is to build up your layers from back to front. Now we just talked about working on the background first and then working on the foreground, but this is actually happening in small parts of the animal as well. When we look at this pig, the back of the head and the ears are further away in space than the snout. And so the hairs around the snout are going to be closer to your viewer. We want those hairs to be applied last, and that's going to help us achieve a really nice sense of depth. So what does this look like? I usually begin with the ears because they are a little bit further back. I build up the hairs in the ears and then I work on the forehead and then I work on the snout. And there is still some back and forth, but again, when it comes to finalizing areas, I'm making sure that those final hairs that are in the foreground are applied at the very end. Tip number five is to work from dark to light. Now, if you are a colored pencil artist that usually works on white papers, this tip may sound absolutely ludicrous for you because you know that if you work on a smooth paper and start with your darks and then try to apply your light values on top, they are not going to stick and you are never going to get the white of the paper back. But with pastel mat, you can apply white hairs directly over the top of a really dark, saturated area. And that is exactly why I almost exclusively use pastel mat when it comes to rendering animal fur, because you really need to be able to draw those light hairs over the top. This tip helps you achieve a greater sense of depth, just like the last two tips, working from background to foreground, working from back of the pig to the front of the pig, working from dark to light. All of these help you develop an order and a structure and help you create depth. Those darks that you lay down first will peek through the lighter hairs that you apply at the end and you'll be able to have a really nice sense of air and space moving through the fur, which is going to help it feel way more lifelike. If you don't have that space moving through your hairs, your animal is going to feel really stiff, really bulky, and almost like it's been slicked down with gel. So. Working from dark to light is going to be a great way for you to enhance the depth. Tip number six is to establish my shadows and darker hairs without using black. Now, I don't use a ton of black in my drawing, but I haven't completely exiled it. I still use it occasionally, but I use it at the very end of my process when I need to push my values just a tiny bit more. And I do this for a couple reasons. Having color in my shadows and in my darkest areas helps my drawing have more vibrancy and more interest. Instead of grabbing for a black when I go into the shadows, I'm selecting dark indigos, dark violets, chocolate colors, and even some really dark reds. These colors are all going to help add interest, variety, and vibrancy to your shadow shapes. And I think it's a much better option than jumping straight to black at the very beginning. If you are currently working with a really small set of colored pencils, like a 12 or a 24 set, you can still achieve some really cool effects. But if realistic fur is your goal, you're going to be really limited with these smaller sets. And this leads me to tip number seven, which is to invest in a larger set of colored pencils. Having a wide selection of dark colors is certainly going to enhance your shadow shapes and the dark areas in your drawing. But having a big selection of 
mid-value colors that vary in intensity and temperature and having a wide variety of light value colors is going to give you a huge advantage when it comes to rendering realistic fur. You've probably already noticed that I am creating this fur texture by laying down one hair at a time. And sure, these hairs overlap sometimes, but they're not actually blending the colors together. When I work on a portrait or a flower, I am actually smooshing the pigments together through very careful blending and burnishing. But here I'm relying on the viewer doing some optical mixing for me to create the color. That means they're looking at these hairs that I have been laid down and their eyes are kind of mixing the colors together. This effect works so much better when you have a lot of colors to choose from. I can look at all of my blues, I can notice the subtle differences between them and I can pick out just the right blue for what I'm doing in the pig. Having several different colors that have just subtle differences allow me to create depth and to get really specific with the color that I'm using. My favorite color pencils to use on pastel matte when I'm drawing animal fur are definitely my Derwent Lightfast colored pencils. And these now come in 100 different colors. What I really like about these pencils is that they will hold a fairly sharp point, which is really important for drawing each and every individual hair, but they also come in a great range of neutral and light value colors. The Polychromos colored pencils are also an oil-based colored pencil that are great for rendering animals, but my only complaint about the 120 colors they have is that there aren't actually that many neutral and light value colors. Polychromos really shines when it comes to high intensity bright colors, so if you're drawing birds and butterflies, this is definitely your set. But the light fast pencils and the luminance colored pencils both have a greater range of light value and neutral colors. If you are interested in purchasing a new larger set of colored pencils, I have several links available down in the notes below. I love making these YouTube videos for you, but the scripting, editing, and filming process take a considerable amount of time. So do me a favor, if you have benefited from some part of this video so far, give that like button a little nudge, and that's gonna tell the YouTube algorithm to share this video with more people. And I really want as many artists as possible to benefit from the work that goes into these videos. Thank you so much for your support. Tip number eight is to pay really close attention to the direction that the hairs are moving and growing in. As I already mentioned, I create fur in my animal drawings by laying down one hair at a time. And to create the most realistic effect possible, I need to make sure that the hairs that I am drawing are going in the correct direction. When you look at the photo reference of this pig, the direction that the hairs are growing in is pretty easy to identify, but that isn't necessarily true for every single animal photo reference. Sometimes you're gonna have to look a little harder or you're going to have to be a little bit creative on figuring out which direction the hairs are going in. This is especially true for photos that don't have very great clarity, for animals that have curly fur, and for animals that have really unique coloring that might distort the way that we view the hair. If you are stuck when you're looking at your photo reference, go ahead and do a search online and look for other similar animals and notice the patterns in their fur. And then when you get to your drawing, try to mimic that as closely as possible. This is going to enhance the depth and the volume in your drawing. Tip number nine is to use more pressure in your final layers. When I am at the end of my drawing and it's time to lay those light hairs directly over the top of the animal or across the background, I am usually pressing really hard. Think of handwriting pressure that is so hard it leaves an indent in the paper. Now, the reason that I'm pressing so hard on these final layers is because I want a really crisp, opaque line, and I can achieve this best with tons of pressure. I only want to do the hair once. If I do it lightly and then have to redraw and redraw, it's gonna get messy and clunky because I'm not gonna be able to get that whisker the exact same every time. So instead I do it once, I sharpen my pencil, I press really hard and I apply that line. 
Additionally, the more colored pencil or pastel that I have on my pastel mat, the more pressure I'm going to need to apply to get those final layers to stick. So if you are new to using that much pressure on a drawing, I recommend having a scrap piece of pastel mat available for you to practice on before you come over to your final piece. Tip number 10 is to keep your pencils super sharp. Now, when you start rendering your fur, those initial hairs are gonna really be more of a background layer. So having your pencils super sharp at the beginning is not quite as important. But as you start applying those final hairs, particularly the hairs that overlap the background a bit, you wanna have a really sharp colored pencil so that you can keep your hairs really light fine and precise. If you're using a blunt or dull colored pencil to apply your final hairs, they're going to be thick, they're going to be clunky, and they're not going to have the same realistic illusion. So when you're towards the end, get used to sharpening your pencils quite a bit. And if you're using the Derwent Lightfast colored pencils or a pencil that is a bit waxier, like Luminance colored pencils, Prisma colored pencils, or the Derwent drawing colored pencils, be prepared for those sharp points to break pretty regularly. The waxier a pencil is, the harder it is to hold a sharp point. So it might be a good idea to have a few oilier colored pencils for the last few layers as well. I also recommend that you have several white colored pencils, both several different white colored pencils because each white from each pencil line is pretty unique and, and it's nice to have options when it comes to your whites your highlights. I like to use a Derwent drawing pencil for my really opaque whites, but then I rely pretty heavily on my Lightfast pencils or even my Polychromos pencils for those really razor sharp lines. But I go through these whites faster than my other colored pencils, so I like to have a set of extra whites available so I never run out and don't have a backup. Okay, you made it through the 10 tips and now it's bonus time. Earlier in the video, I shared with you that I made a mistake on this drawing and I wanted to show you how I fixed it. So my original plan was to end with an eight by eight inch drawing of this pick. But when I had it finished and took it over to my paper cutter and made the first cut, I realized that my drawing was actually only seven inches tall. And I needed to extend my drawing another inch or so to be able to have that eight by eight inch composition. So I brought my drawing back over to my drawing board and I began extending the background and the fur another inch. I started by going to my photo reference because the cropped photo reference didn't have that information. So I reversed some of my edits so I could see more of the pic. And when I looked at the photo, I decided I didn't want to draw a lot of attention to the legs because I felt like they were a little bit too narrow. So I looked at the shapes and I looked at the direction of the fur and I kind of creatively made up some hair that would be convincing as if this pig was sitting to have a very formal portrait taken or something. And I was able to create what I felt was a pretty convincing good solution to a situation where I was a little bit worried if it was even going to work out. When I came over the top with these final hairs and this final background layer, I didn't add pan pastel again. The pan pastels at that point were already put away and I didn't want to introduce something that might make a mess or that might mess up pieces that I'd already done. And you'll notice that I was able to create a really realistic texture and transition without using those pan pastels, further emphasizing that pan pastels are not necessary. They're a nice bonus, but not mandatory for doing this kind of artwork. The other thing that I was really happy about that just is super special about pastel mat is that there wasn't a line that divided my original work from my new work. And some of that is just because of the awesome character of the paper. But another part of that is that I actually drew several hairs through that kind of line that would have shown up. So I was camouflaging that there was ever a, an ending that was up higher. I'm really glad that I decided to stick to my original plan to extend my drawing so that it was going to be an eight by eight inch square and that I put the extra effort into finishing my artwork. And I want you to take that same level of pride in your artwork as well. If it is within your ability at this moment, do the changes, make the adjustments, 
improve your artwork so that each piece that you finish represents your best work at this point in time. And that is really my bonus tip, tip number 11 that I have for you. Always try your best. That's how you're going to improve. That's how you're going to continue to grow and develop as an artist. 